Hello, hello, and welcome to the Tip of the Iceberg podcast, brought to you as always by InsideThePenguins.com. I'm your host, Nick Berlansky, joined as always by Nick Horwat. And if we seem like we're in a better mood, despite it being 8.30 on a Monday morning, it is because the NHL season is here. I would say it starts tomorrow. I would say the Penguins start on Thursday. And only one of those sentences would be true, Horwat, because the Nashville Predators took it to the San Jose Sharks in Czechia to lead off the NHL season on Friday. I thought ESPN, because that's how I found out about this. Like, I consider myself to be someone pretty tuned in to the National Hockey League as a whole. I learned about this after the game was already played on a push notification from ESPN. Mm -hmm. I thought ESPN had accidentally prematurely sent out a push notification five days early from a Tuesday, which we all expected when the season started. Did you know that there was a game being held across the seas in the first NHL regular season game of 2022? So I knew there was the global series thing happening. Mm -hmm. Um, I knew those teams had played uh, local teams uh, which I thought was kind of cool. Uh, I thought it would have been really funny. I didn't look at the scores. I just kind of saw they were playing. I thought it would have been really funny if one of the NHL teams lost mm. to, like, Berlin HC or whoever they were playing. Um, so I knew it was happening. I did not realize it was regular season play. Yeah. Uh, while the Penguins' final preseason game was being played, there was a regular season game being played, four standings and four points. As of right now, oh man, I should have looked at the standings. Uh, who won those games? Uh, the Predators won on Friday. I think that might have been the only game. You would hope so. Um, but as of right now, the uh, Nashville Predators are leading the league in points. That won't last long. But yeah, I thought it was, I knew that they were happening. I thought it was interesting that they were real. The Predators won twice. They yep. won both games. Uh, yeah. Also, Nashville getting getting that nod is interesting um but i digress i think it's weird that they did it and it was regular season play i don't i don't care either way i think i think it's fine but it's just the fact that there was some so the lineup issues also kind of and whenever i say lineup i mean these dates that every nhl team needs to meet to be compliant with the cap and the uh, roster size i don't i haven't paid attention to it because i kind of forgot it was happening did Nashville and San Jose have to input it earlier? Probably. So that's weird. Right? Like, why not make it a league mandate there? But also, preseason games still need to get played. That's I don't thing. know. I think like, I I pulled out my mouse pad uh, calendar from whenever the Penguins played in Sweden. Um, and they played in Sweden in back to back nights, Saturday, Sunday, and then had the week off. But it was the normal start to the regular season, I think, that year because. Traditionally, the NHL season started like the first few days of October. Yeah, uh, yeah, October 4th and 5th is when the Penguins played in Sweden, which I think mm-hmm. matches with uh, the rest of the league that year. That's a deep cut to find out, but still, you know what I mean. I, it's weird that they started a week before everyone else and that due dates for things are tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Here's the thing, and, and we'll close this subject and move on to more Penguins-centric subjects after this, we promise. But I took a tangent there. If there's ever a situation like this, like you should really separate your seasons, like preseason, regular season, postseason. There should never be regular season games being played at the same time as preseason games. There should never be regular season games being played at the same time as postseason games. We saw that a couple years back. It is just something where, you know, NHL, this is an easy thing to do to make you seem like you have your stuff together. And when it doesn't happen and when literally nobody, even people that cover the sport, aren't aware that these games are starting, like it might be a failure for me, it might be a failure for you to not recognize this, but I really don't feel like they they marketed this at all. So I, I, I consider it a failure on the NHL's part uh, of marketing because I feel like one of us would have seen it or somebody would have seen it because I didn't even see it in my feed on Twitter and usually – You know, Twitter's on everything, especially if there's games. I just saw started seeing highlights, and I was like, oh, I guess these count. So, like I said, I known and knew it was happening. I didn't realize there were regular season games, that's all. And as I look at other teams around the year of the 2008-2009 season, 
Penguins started, what did I say, the fourth and the fifth. Mm-hmm. Uh, Toronto, at least, started on the ninth. So there was still a little separation there. But I guess awkward. I don't, I just, I don't know what the preseason games were. Mm-hmm. I don't know if maybe everyone had a week off, but it's just awkward. I do remember back then, the, the only thing I do remember from that is it was weird watching those Penguins games because they were also matinees and to have the season opener be a matinee and a foreign. It was weird, but it was a cool experience. And, and we got a lot of great video content out of it from that 2008 Pittsburgh Penguins team. But let's get into the Pittsburgh Penguins world. I think five minutes is more than plenty uh, to talk about the global series between the Predators and the Sharks. But uh, Jesus, uh, let's get into the Pittsburgh Penguins because they did finalize their opening roster. Of course, teams must be cap compliant by 5 p.m. Eastern today on Monday, October 10th. There is hockey to be played this week, regular season hockey. But the Pittsburgh Penguins, to get cap compliant, made just kind of a flurry of moves over the weekend. Sam Poulan and Philip Lindbergh, two younger players for the Pittsburgh Penguins, both sent down, both waiver exempt. So that was an easy decision there for the Penguins. Poulan, I think we all expect that he had one of the best camps that he has ever had. And we expect him to make the team at some point this year, mm-hmm. make his NHL debut at some point this year. And who knows, maybe he is a full-time NHLer by this year. Or maybe he has to wait till next year, but he's getting closer and he's on a really good trajectory, much better than he was last season. Then the Pittsburgh Penguins sent Mark Friedman through waivers and he cleared Horwat. Uh, I want to pause here and talk about this for a second because I fully expected whoever the Pittsburgh Penguins put on waivers of their nine defensemen, I expected them to make it through waivers or not make it through waivers. I, sorry, I expected them to be claimed just because it seems like any one of these nine guys would improve a lot of starting six guys or starting six defenses across the National Hockey League. So I was a little surprised when Mark Friedman cleared waivers. Were you? Not necessarily. I think because I think of that group that we are discussing, uh, Friedman was the least likely to be taken. He's yes, he's a guy that are a dime a dozen around the league. You could go out and sign a Mark Friedman. Really, just sign a average size defenseman who's going to play in your third line and say, Hey, can you just be a bit more of a pest? Mm-hmm. And that's it. That's all you really need to do. You can find that pretty much anywhere. Sure. His course numbers are great. And sure. He does bring a little extra oomph to the lineup, but you get what I'm saying that his skill level and his type of player is just easy to find. Um, so I wasn't super surprised to hear Friedman made it all the way, made it all the way through uh, and will be sent to the minors. I was a little surprised he was sent to the minors, though. I don't know why. I think just because, again, I would have been shocked by any choice because it's we have nine NHL caliber defensemen. While it is a good problem to have, push came to shove. Yeah. And we held on to our cards a little too long. We talked about it enough. And it's not that we're, you know, laying in the – it's not that the Penguins are laying in the bed they made. because I mean, they kind of are, but it's also – they just kind of got handcuffed with this issue. No one wanted to help, which is mm-hmm. exactly how it should have gone. Yeah. So we're coming up with the answers. Freedom was the first shoe to fall. We'll get into more. Yeah. And listen, there's some people that took what we said on Thursday when we talked about Ron Hextall overplaying his hand. I still believe he did. I'm not taking that back at all. Uh, but there's people that thought that we were saying that Ron Hextall was horrific all offseason. He didn't do a good job. Yeah, he did some good things. He did, but he also did some bad things. And if you're not going to call that out, then why have a podcast? Like at that huh. point, then you're just being a sponsor for the team. And that's not what we're here to do. We're here to correctly and accurately and fairly judge everything about this team, including Ron Hextall. So yeah, uh, I-, I think he overplayed his hand and I'm surprised that Mark Freeman cleared waivers. I'm sure the Pittsburgh Penguins are thrilled that he did. Uh, I talked to Hunter Hodes of Locked On Penguins. Uh, we were talking back and forth and You know, Hunter had a really good point. Mark Friedman doesn't have the national name that some people might think he does because he's really good for Pittsburgh. But especially whenever you kind of slide him in there and sneak him in there with a long list. I mean, we saw it when when Friedman was announced on waivers. I believe it was Elliot Friedman, coincidentally, who who put that out. Or Chris Johnston, it might have been. His name was like 16th or something. It was a big tweet with a bunch of names. And his name doesn't stand out. Like, yes, to us, it stands out because it's Pittsburgh and we're covering the Penguins. But his name doesn't stand out among a group of names. So I I guess you can say that's a shrewd business decision. But at the same time, knowing 
that Friedman's name does not stick out and might be why he cleared waivers. Yeah, like it's a long list of names. I mean, like just looking at even the day after, there was an even longer list. So like mm-hmm. you're sure there are guys in these organizations whose job it is to look at every single name and find out information on them if they want to make a claim or not. You're not doing that though. It's you have your team in front of you. That's the play, those are the players you are worried about. So I, I it makes sense that he flew through for sake of a he's he's only known around Pittsburgh, let's just be honest, unless Philly wanted him back for some reason. And B, he, like I said, there are a time it doesn't out there. You could find him. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't surprising to me that he flew that he made it past and eh, he'll be back up without mm-hmm. doubt. Okay, so then they sent down Ty Smith yesterday on uh, on Sunday. Uh, and this was purely a cap compliance move. I think everybody knows that. I'm not reinventing the wheel. I'm not saying anything people don't already know. The reason Ty Smith was sent down is so the Penguins could become cap compliant by the deadline today. And, mm-hmm. you know, he has the waivers exempt contract, which made it easy for him. But he was still practicing on that third defense pairing with Jan Ruda. There's still a chance that he plays on Thursday in the Penguins season opener. So just because he didn't make the opening roster doesn't mean he's not making the opening night roster. There is a there is a small distinction there because there's still three days for Ron Hextall to make a move to open up a spot to allow Ty Smith to come back up in cap compliance and still have the Penguins under the NHL salary cap quite some 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 very good acrobatics need to happen for that but yes it is yeah. still possible he can come up we're holding on to as of right now one fewer roster spot than the league uh ceiling Max. we're at 22 of 23 mm-hmm. uh, and carrying two defensemen before it goes down we're not screwed but we gotta act quickly and figure things out so penguins are carrying one defenseman seven they have seven on their, their oh, NHL just roster. in and then right. Okay. Yeah. Still. The things moves need to be made quickly. Mm-hmm. Uh, if, if stuff happens, it has to happen. Literally. I would say today or tomorrow. I wouldn't wait until Wednesday uh, because games do start Tuesday. Don't they? Wait a minute. Game Aside start from games yes. start on Tuesday. Other than okay. the, the global, global series, which we talked about, but no, uh, when you look at it, it Ron Hextall's position, I don't, I, and we'll talk about, I don't see him making a move. Like, I know that he has to, and if he wants Ty Smith to be on the roster on Thursday, but it is very, di- unless he's going to eat some crow and clearly lose a deal or give up or get less than he wanted because he needs to make the move, I don't see it happening because he's had three months to make this. And I know deadlines can sometimes get things done faster than they would otherwise, but if you look at it, you would have to imagine it's, you know, is it Chad Ruedel? Or is it P.O. Joseph, who for the first time in his career has made the Pittsburgh Penguins opening roster? Joseph is, has broken camp with the NHL roster. He's one of the 22 names. He figures to be, if nothing changes, which there still is a good chance that they might, P.O. Joseph might be on that opening right night roster right next to Jan Ruda on the Penguins' third parent. Yeah, it, and that's perfectly fine. I don't even hate that option. I, I think no matter the outcome that we had here, we were going to be a good defensive core on the NHL roster. There was going to be that. So no matter how it played out, it was going to be okay for the Penguins um, so long as you didn't lose anybody, which we haven't. So that's the bonus here. I think if we were to try and send – anyone through waivers, P.O. Joseph would have been the most likely candidate to be scooped. So yeah. again, we're holding on to him a little bit longer by holding him in the NHL. And again, that's perfectly fine. Let's say the second he falters, okay, here comes Ty Smith because he can just be pulled up. He can be sent down. We have options. So it, there was no dumb move. Mm-hmm. It was just a interesting and, and slightly off-putting move to – you say overplay the hand. I say you stayed in too long. You didn't make a move. It was. Yeah, he overplayed his hand. Yeah, just he, he held inst- on. Like he, instead of folding, he overplayed it. He checked for too damn long. He yeah. didn't, you know, throw it. He didn't make a raise. He didn't fold. He didn't. He just kind of sat there, waited for the river, whichever one the last one is. Yeah. So 
uh, here's the thing. And, and P.O. Joseph, I think everybody's saying that the move will be done is a little premature. Like there's some people that are saying Ty Smith's going to be in the lineup. Don't worry. Don't you worry about that. Another move is coming. What is the rush? Like I, I, I get Ty Smith outperformed P.O. Joseph in camp. He did. And he deserves mm-hmm. to be on that lineup. But this is a business as much as it is a sport. Like this isn't backyard hockey in your backyard rink outdoor rink you have to actually figure in the finances especially when you're the pittsburgh penguins and you have so many players that are not on league minimum contracts like there's only a handful of guys probably less than a half dozen that they're ever going to have in their lineup that are on league minimum contracts or under a million dollar contracts throughout this entire season so i don't know the rush let po joseph get a couple games under his belt see what you have at the nhl level see how he responds to the challenge of playing at the nhl level on a line with Jan Ruda. Like, let that play out. And I understand that Ty Smith, and you talked to him on Friday after the game, Ty Smith believes that he did enough to make the roster. And honestly, with his performance, he probably did. Yeah. But unfortunately, it's a business, and he might have to stay in Wilkes-Barre for a week or two, play a couple of games down there once their season starts. And that's not an awful thing for a 22-year-old that was shuttled into the league very quickly by the New Jersey Devils. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't hurt to play a couple of AHL games to keep your legs underneath you. Because I think what people need to understand is, it seems like Ty Smith is part of the future plans for the Pittsburgh Penguins as of this moment. They brought him in via trade. Clearly, they liked him. They thought it was a better position to have with a young defenseman on a cheap contract. They're going to have to re-sign him after the season if they want him. But after camp, it seems like they're very invested in Ty Smith. So, what is the rush of bringing him up right away? It's not the NFL season with Kenny Pickett where, hey, you need to get him reps because there's only 17 games of game action. You have 82 games spanned over five or six months. You can let him marinate in the AHL for two or three weeks to start the season while you figure this stuff out with P.O. Joseph for Chad Ruedel. Because, again, what's the also, what's the alternative here? You healthy scratch him. That sounds like a bad idea as well because that's achieving nothing. That well, is, no, I mean, I, I feel like if Smith was up, he'd be playing, but you'd be exactly. scratching Joseph. And again, does not. You don't want that either. You want both of those guys on the ice one way or the other through hell or high water. You want them playing, whether it is in the NHL or the AHL. You don't want them sitting in the press box, eating the peanuts. And that's what Chad Ruedel is for. Even Mike Sullivan said he, Chad Ruedel has this uncanny ability to sit out for long periods of time and then come back into the lineup and be gangbusters. Mm -hmm. He's the only player that I can think of on our lineup, and maybe Mark Friedman too, who you're okay with sitting down Mm -hmm. because you know nothing's really going to happen to their progression as a player. Mark Friedman is 26. He's about where he's going to be for his career. He's about to hit his prime. It's a little interesting. Chad Ruiel, I believe he's 31, 32. He's set. If he is still able to maintain that sitting out for a long period of time and then getting pushed back into the roster and having that same level of ability, perfect. We've done it. We have him for two more years. So, mm-hmm. yeah, it, it, those are the only two players that I can think of that you would want to do that to. So you want, no matter who it is, Joseph, or you want both Joseph and Smith playing. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter where it is. You want them on the ice, getting reps. If you need to make the switch, you make the switch, pull the trigger. And it's just, this is just the way things had to fly out for now. So you talked to him on Friday with Ty Smith. He believes that he he should have made the roster. Would you say that? Uh, he gave the very hockey answer of, well, yeah. it's not up to me. It's up to, you know, the, the front office and the coaching staff. Mm-hmm. And I would say pretty much if you read between the lines, yeah, he thinks he uh, made the roster because um, – he outperformed P.O. Joseph at every turn, it seemed. A lot of people on Twitter had noticed that he was just a different player this in, in this organization than he was in New Jersey. Mm-hmm. This system helps him out a lot more. His new line mate helps him out a lot more. He said Jan Ruda is such a good defensive defenseman that Ty Smith is able to do his offensive defensive things, and mm-hmm. that really resonates with the play that Ty Smith can put on. Ty Smith was able to pick up a very smart assist um, on a fan, Jan Ruda shot, no less. Mm-hmm. And a goal that at first glance, I thought it kind of just found its way to the net. But yeah, um, still, he was able to walk out in that final preseason game with a goal and an assist. So it's very, he did all the right things. Whereas Pio Joseph, 
was there. He looked big and he looked strong. And Mike Sullivan said he, Keo Joseph had his best game of the preseason. Um, and he's been improving all camp. I'd let him keep improving in the NHL. So yes, I think Smith does deserve the spot, but the, with the situation that we're in and the holding on to the hand for too long from Hexall, it's just the only outcome that was a, that we could get to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we're running a little over here, but there's a lot to talk about as the NHL season gets yeah. kicked off this week. And honestly, with Ty Smith, he he probably understands it, and yeah. he probably sees it with the fact that literally up until the day that he was sent down, he was playing in the top six. Like, mm-hmm. he knows the Penguins, and I'm sure he was assured by many that the Penguins have big plans for him. And and I've spoken this to so many people since he got sent down in the 12 hours since that he's going to play 50-plus games this year for the Pittsburgh Penguins. You're going to see plenty of Ty Smith. This is just a, a reaction to what happened over the summer and where the Penguins are at financially and with their roster. So they're going to eventually get it figured out. They have to. They have no other option but to do that. And you're going to see a guy like Ty Smith. But at the same time, let's let's not rush uh, to get P.O. Joseph out of here if he is indeed on the trade block because I do want to see what you have because it's a good problem to have if you have two good young defensemen and maybe you can you can make something else happen. I mean, who knows how this roster could be configured if both of those guys – are playing like NHL regulars during this season. So we'll see how that all plays out. Before we cut to break, I did want to bring up, and I'll bring it up for our YouTube viewers so they can look at it. The NHL Network Top 50 has been released in its order. Sidney Crosby finishes in the top 10. He goes number seven overall. Jake Gensel finishes 34th. Chris Letang finishes 36th. And Evgeny Malkin does not finish in the top 10. 50. So Horwat, really quickly, what are your thoughts on Malkin being snubbed from the top 50 players of the NHL heading into this season? You know, it's a good league. I'm not total. I don't, I don't think I care one way or the other because it is just one network's list. Um, but looking, I mean, looking at some of these names, I think I would rather have Malkin on my team over certain players that are listed here. Um, also, who's the bottom line here? Are you able to drop this, uh, I Lower don't third know year, if no? I can. So uh, it's Johnny Gaudreau, Kyle Connor, Ryan O'Reilly, and Jack Hughes is, of course, number 50. All right. Well, I would definitely have uh, Malkin over a guy like, as of right now, at least, you know, Moritz Sider, as good as he is. I think I would just rather have Evgeny Malkin or maybe even a Devon Taves, despite how good, like, these are all great players. It's hard to make the argument one way or the other. Um, do I think Malkin should have been in the top 50? Sure, but who are you taking out? Yeah, it's, it's obviously it's all an opinion based list, but I just want to bring the larger aspect of uh, Evgeny Malkin kind of disrespected a little bit, has been pretty much all summer long, and uh, I really think he's going to be able to go in and, and shut people up this year. And he, here's the top mm-hmm. ten. I know I don't know how much is getting a uh, cut off of that as well, but uh, just yeah, the, the uh, five the and two. ten. Uh, Alex Ovechkin at number 10 and Leon Dreisaitl is number five. Those are the names missing. But Sidney Crosby gets seventh right behind Andre Vasilevsky, but right ahead of Victor Hedman. I think it's a fair placement for Crosby. You? It is. I just think the names around them are weird, as always. I get very... uh, Having goalies up that high is always so interesting. So, like, they do have to be Andre Vasilevsky level. Mm -hmm. Um, But, man, it's... It's hard to all. It's always hard to compare a goalie to a forward, but you know this this spot at seven doesn't surprise me with Sidney Crosby just because he's been every year. It seems he drops kind of down the list behind these younger players that just take this league over. Connor McDavid, Kale McCarr being number two is shocking because of guys like Austin Matthews and Nathan McKinnon is about to be the highest paid player in the NHL, and he's apparently, according to the NHL Network not even the best player on his team i agree with that though like i, I do i, don't I disagree. think I, I think kale mccarr is otherworldly he is otherworldly type player and we won't get into it too much because we have a large segment coming up in segment two but uh, kale mccarr is otherworldly so honestly normally whenever these lists have come out in seasons past i've said you know i get it Sidney crosby's getting older but he's still better than that i i can't say that this year because yeah because honestly even 
Leon Dreisaitl is the only guy I would question. He's just a monster. Like, look at what he did in the playoffs. And he was very injured mm -hmm. during the playoffs. So, and of course, Pittsburgh Penguins fans have watched their dynamic duo, their two-headed monster for so long. You look at the top five, there's two dynamic duos there. There's McDavid and Dreisaitl of Edmonton. And there's McCarr and McKinnon of, of Colorado. So uh, that theme still looms large. Well, we're going to take a quick break. Long first segment there. Thank you for sticking with us through that one kind of all over the place. We're going to rein it in here and give you our official 2022-23 Pens predictions after the break. Welcome back to the Tip of the Iceberg podcast, brought to you as always by InsideThePenguins.com. We have our Pens predictions for the 2022-23 season. We did way too early predictions back in June. That was where it stood there. I know I have a couple different answers from what I had back in June. So Horwat, let's start it off with penalty minutes, because when you look at the penalty minutes, for the Pittsburgh Penguins, there's one guy to me that always sticks out, and I'm going to stick with him here. I'm going to say Evgeny Malkin leads the Penguins in penalty minutes this year. One, because I expect him to stay healthy this year. Like I have a feeling, and it might be misplaced, similar to my misplaced feeling that the Peng or the Steelers would cover the 14 point spread against the Buffalo Bills. But I have a feeling that he's going to stay relatively healthy. I'm not going to say he's going to play all 82 games. We'll talk about that in a second but I expect him to stay more healthy than he's been in years past. He's averaged over a penalty minute per game in his career with 1,008 penalty minutes in 981 career games. He's hunting down Kevin Stevens for the all-time Penguins record. He's 40 penalty minutes away. He's clearly going to get that this season. So my penalty minutes leader is Evgeny Malkin. Who do you got? I am going to agree with you, and it's – simply because of the fact of numbers i'm looking at last season's numbers which is where a lot of my answers will probably probably be based in but last season of Genny malkin played 41 games and hit 24 penalty minutes mm. um double that up you know the, the to a full 82 game season he would hit uh sorry 48 penalty minutes i can't do math which is only one minute one singular 60 seconds behind chris letang who led the team last year yeah so I think you do give Malkin that more time. Sure, he's getting better. He's getting a, a lot better at not taking penalties, but um, I just think it's hard when you're the least penalized team in the league mm -hmm. uh, to also really come up with a good answer for this, but I think just the way Malkin is, we know he can go red mist. We know he can eat up those big ones and take dumb ones. It'll be. I think it might be close between him and Latang, but I believe Malkin gets the edge and takes down that record because he's close to it. I forget He's what the number away. is exactly. He's 40, 40 away. Yep. Yeah, that'll happen pretty quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he, he averages over a penalty minute per game, so he could have that notched up uh, by the midway point if he sticks to his, his career average. But So we both have Evgeny Malkin for penalty minutes. I know that's a change for you. You had Chris Latane back in June, but like we said, that is very early predictions, and of course things change as you see these guys actually take the ice before the season. And I don't now even remember my old predictions, so <laughs> that can help too. Let's move over to a Tip of the Iceberg exclusive award that we give out every year. That is the Iron Penguin Award handed out to the player that plays in every single game this year slated for all 82. So, so this player would have to play in all 82 games. Horwat last year's winner, Evan Rodriguez, has departed. So who do you think, if anybody, you could the, the answer to this could very well be nobody. Who do you think could be the Iron Penguin Award? Who's your prediction? Uh, we hope it might be more than one person, but I'm going to stick with just a singular answer of Jake Gensel. I think him shooting for possibly 50 goals, possibly 100 points, uh, he would have to play all 82. That would be a necessity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is, is that is that the that's end? all I got? That, that's that's all you got. He has to score 50, so he has to play in 82. Okay, well that's fair. Well, that's um, what he's gunning for. Yeah, the only way I think he does get out, I think he gets stay healthy all season. The only way he does miss a game is if he's healthy scratched game 82 for the playoffs. Yeah, that's a possibility. Jake Gensel has remained healthy throughout his career. 
<laughs> except for that one injury. Like he had that one shoulder injury. And other than that, he's been healthy. Last year, he missed the first game of the season due to COVID. But other than that, he he's played in all these games. Jake Gensel, if he does win it again this year, if he plays in all 82 games, he will become the first two-time winner of the Iron Penguin Award in its history. Now, we've done this for three seasons already. Two of the three seasons, we've had two winners. Last year was the only one where we didn't. I think that it goes back to two winners this year. I agree with you. Jake Gensel is my prediction, one of them. But I think Kasperi Kapanen also plays in all 82 games this year. I, I like Kapanen's chances. I, I think, one, the organization has a renewed sense of trust in Kasperi Kapanen. Two, I, I think he's going to have a bounce-back season, which is going to avoid that healthy scratch. And I think, three, the way he plays the game. Yes, we've seen him. He can be a physical player when he wants to be. He body checks. He does all the fun stuff like that. But his skating is good enough, and he's fast enough, and he is smart enough when he's on the ice that he never really takes that big hit. He kind of is really able to avoid it. So you know what? I, I have him as well. So Jake Gensel and Kasperi Kapanen are my predictions for the Iron Penguin Award. You're sticking with just Gensel. Yeah, I think so. Okay. So let's move over to goals. I'm just going to go right through it because I also have Jake Gensel. I had Evgeny Malkin previously. I might have overestimated, but I really do think Evgeny Malkin is going to still score close to 40 goals this year. In, in, in a line with what I've said already is that I think he's going to be healthy. So I think Malkin gets close to 40. But man, I really feel like Jake Cancel is going to push that 50 goal mark this season. And I don't see anybody else outscoring him. So mm -hmm. I have to go with Jake Gensel for goals. I know, I know it was the preseason. I know it was the very bad Buffalo Sabres, but there was something dynamic between Jake and Sid during that game. There was something, oh man, their chemistry is in midseason form already. They are ready to go. Those two are going to push points, goals, assists, all of it to not new levels that have never been seen before in the NHL, but to just incredible heights this year. I have Jake Gensel leading this team in goals as well because Sizz is going to be setting him up all season long. Uh, does he push 50? He's going to get damn close, I think. I don't know about making it, but he's going to be damn, damn close. He might, and then as for 100 points, again, that's a little harder, but all of it is going to be damn close. I think uh, while I have... Jake leading in point or leading in goals. I don't know about points yet for a reason. Well, we'll get there in a couple minutes, but before we get to points, let's get to power play points. The Penguins man advantage has been much maligned throughout the preseason. They looked pretty good on Friday against the Buffalo Sabres in the preseason finale, but we'll see what they're able to accomplish this year. Hopefully better than 19th in the national hockey league. But who do you have leading the Penguins in points on the man advantage points? So it could be assists as well. Yes. Power play points. You know, just because the whole thing kind of filters through him still a little bit, Chris Letang, he's going to be dishing the puck a little bit more this year. Like I had mentioned, he still has a great opportunity to eclipse another career year, and it doesn't even have to come in the form of high scoring. It can be an increased level of defense. So um, with all of that being said, sure, the power play needs to improve, vastly improve, and become what it should be when you see guys like – Sidney Crosby, Evgeny Malkin, Jake Gensel, Chris Letang, Brian Russ, for the first minute and a half of it, yeah, if it all filters through Letang, he should be able to uh, sling in quite a few apples. Mm -hmm. See, with that, I I really, like, I like your pick of Letang. I think it's a good thought because it, he usually touches the puck on mm -hmm. every single power play, and it does filter through him. But I really also think that of all of the players on that unit, you look at last season, Crosby led the team with 30 points, eight goals, 22 assists. Evgeny Malkin, who only played half the season, had 20. He had nine power play goals, which was good for second on the Pittsburgh Penguins team. Forgot about that. So I'm going to go with Evgeny Malkin because, you know, if in half a season he is only at 66% of Crosby, who led the team, I think in a full season with Evgeny Malkin entering healthy, because remember, he was coming off a knee surgery and he was able to do that. So I, I really do think that the unit runs more through Gino than it does through Latang. Just because Latang's at the point, I, I think it runs through Gino more because you see him on that bumper slot, and he's the one that feeds between 
Latang and Crosby. And Crosby mm-hmm. can make that cross ice pass to Gensel, can make that cross ice pass to Rust, which cuts out Latang for the third player to touch the puck. So I'm going to go with uh, Evgeny Malkin on this one for power play points. It's fair enough. I like that one too. He, t- he can tack in the goals. That's kind of the help as well. Yeah, he he's always the guy that kind of ends the play, but also I think that positioning too, that go between between Latang and Crosby, they don't get the puck directly from one to uh, one to another very often. It usually goes between them and Evgeny Malkin. So, yeah, I'll I'll stick with Malkin on this one. I'm pretty confident about that. Uh, we have three more to get to here. Points just overall on the season. You talked about it before. You said maybe Jake Gensel, but you have another answer up your sleeve. No, uh, his his uh trigger man, a, a trigger man, whatever his setup man. That's what I'm looking for. Sidney Crosby, just just another year of Sidney Crosby leading the Penguins in points. That's all. I don't. It doesn't need much explanation. Whenever the only people to lead this team in points since their arrival was Crosby and Malkin. I think Kunitz slipped in there once, but that was weird. Mm-hmm. And the um, shortened season in 2012 13. That he was playing a lot of a lot with Malkin that year, and a lot of those points came from Malkin. Mm-hmm. So uh, yeah, it just it's just another year of Cindy Crosby leading to this team of points. It might not be the goals thing, but it's going to be setting up Jake Gensel like nobody's business. Make mm-hmm. those two are going to be a problem for the NHL this year. So yeah, he's gonna he had 53 assists last year in 69 games. If he's playing more than 69 games this year, he's going to have far more than 59, 53 assists. Mm-hmm. I agree with Sidney Crosby. Uh, I, I think it's a pretty, pretty obvious one. Like I, I don't like to agree on a lot of things, like everything. And I, I know you want variety, of course. but Sidney Crosby has not offered up the opportunity for variety in his career for this no. position, you know, points to lead the Penguins is Sidney Crosby's bag. Like, that's what he does. Evgeny Malkin was able to do it a couple times, like you mentioned. Uh, Chris Kunitz letting goals once. Jake Gensel's letting goals. Jake Gensel halved the points lead with Sidney Crosby, despite playing, I believe, 10 more games than him. But it, it's going to be Sidney Crosby, because I also see him passing the century mark this season. It was part of the bold predictions that mm-hmm. we did last week. If he didn't listen to it, go back and listen last Monday's episode. I see Sidney Crosby passing the century mark, I don't think that it's landing on it like he did the last time he hit 100 points. I say he notches 106 points this season. That's my official prediction. There it is. I see 34 goals, 72 assists for Sidney Crosby. And it sounds very correct with the lines. If you look at last season, he scored 31 goals and 53 assists. And with the extra games played, if he can play close to 82, I think that's where he finishes up. Just decided to have the exact stat line at the ready. Do you have his plus minus as well? He's going to finish as a plus 25. I don't know. I didn't look into that, but I, I actually <laughs> did some research to come up with 106 at least. And that's fair. And it's a good number. It's eclipsing that 100 mark at his age would be incredible. And just, I mean, not that his, you know, not that his uh, legend needs to be solidified anymore, no. but hitting that kind of number this late in his career is just ugh, stupid. I love it. They already have most of his plaque engraved at the Hockey Hall of Fame, so it's not like he needs very it's, much else to add. They just to need it. to enter like it's just blank spaces where the where his career point total, all the stat totals are going to finish up. Everything else is set. Yeah, and the Stanley Cup championships is still blank because he has three, but he could get another. At least we're hoping so. But to do that, they're going to have to win a lot of games in the regular season. So Horwat, win total for the Pittsburgh Penguins this year. Do you have a prediction there? I have a prediction. Let's see. So they had 46 last season. Mm-hmm. I think they, that was third of in the division. And I think they can make the jump to second if they try, if they like these draft Kings predictions are going with, mm-hmm. I could see us probably touching 49 to 50. Okay. But I'm going to go on the low end and say 49. And maybe that comes mm, the 11 overtime losses though. Yeah. That's, that's, that's an issue. That's an issue that needs to be figured out. I'm going to put, bump it up a little more. Uh, we rarely do get more than 50 wins. In fact, it's only happened, oh, in the entire span of this team, four times. Mm-hmm. All four, all three of them, three of which coming in the last, or coming in uh, the Crosby era. Man, you know what? I'm going to go 50 clean. You know what? I'm going to bump it up to 50. Okay. When looking at last season, like you mentioned, 46 wins, 11 overtime losses, which is a problem for the Pittsburgh Penguins. For some reason, they're not good in overtime. They're not good in the shootout. Like, they'll win a couple of games, 
but they usually always have a good bit of overtime losses, which yeah. makes no sense considering the players that they have had over the past 15 seasons plus. I'm going to say they improved from last season, but I think it's going to end up around the same place. I think they get one more win from last season. Mm. I think they get 47 wins, but I see it similar to last year where they have a lot of OT losses because it, it baffles me how bad they are in the overtime. Like yeah. I don't understand what their attempts are. And you see it sometimes when it works out, you're like, that seems so easy. Why is it that you make it look so difficult in other instances? I, I don't understand, but overall, I think they have a better defense. I think they're going to get a better start from Casey to Smith, which is going to help Tristan Jari in the long run. I think getting Malkin and Crosby to start the season is such an added boost that it's going to let them get off to a good start, despite they, they got off to a good start last year. But uh, I think they do it again this year with Crosby and Malkin in the lineup. And I think you're going to get better performances from 16 and 42, from, from Jason Zucker, from Kasperi Kapanen. So I think overall this team's going to be better. I just think as a whole, the Eastern Conference is going to be more difficult this year. Yeah, yeah, it is. The Atlantic has gotten a lot better somehow. Mm -hmm. And while the Metro is still a dogfight, Every team is difficult, and I I would toss and say the Flyers are not, but we are the Penguins, and we find ways to lose to the Flyers. So every team in the Metro, or the Penguins at least, is a difficult game. Mm -hmm. So I do still think this team improves, and you know the Flyers games may be difficult, but we find ways to win. And Tristan Jari's got a lot to prove this year. Casey DeSmith has a lot to prove this year. So our goaltending should be improved just by sheer fact that these guys need to be better. Um, so I'm just slipping us with four extra wins. And I think we figure that overtime thing out. We'll see. Uh, we'll, we'll see about that. But I do think that the Eastern conference is going to be much tougher this year than it was last. I mean, you look at last year, the beginning of the season, the Detroit Red Wings were really good for the first couple of months. I think that they're still on that trajectory. Uh, I think you look at the added confidence that the New York Rangers will have heading into the season. You look at how much better, in my opinion, the Washington Capitals are going to be this season than they were last. It's going to be tough to get wins in the East. And I think the Penguins do duplicate what they were able to do, add one more. And with that, I think they finish second in the Metropolitan Division. I am agreeing with the DraftKings odds. I know mm -hmm. I ranked them fourth in my Metropolitan Division power rankings to start the season, but that is just what it is. That's where I think they are at the beginning of the season. But I think through the year, the veteran leadership, the experience, and the ability to have a lineup that has the chemistry together. Like that forward lineup, people are saying, yeah, well, you ran it back. Well, there's an added bonus there, and they have that chemistry. And most of them un underperformed last year. Mm -hmm. Like they underperformed, or you didn't get to see enough of them. Ricardo mm -hmm. Kell, you didn't see enough of them. Underperformances from Zucker, Kapanen, from... I would say Teddy Bluger, Jeff Carter at the end of the season. There were underperformances. Now, if they can stay healthy, that's a big question. But I have the Pittsburgh Penguins finishing second in the Metropolitan Division and notching a playoff berth for the 17th straight season. Uh, yeah, I do as well. And that's for everything you said, but also looking around the division, I think the Rangers and Hurricanes finished as the two teams in front of us uh, last season. One of them, I... It's got to be one of them. Has to falter, obviously. But I think the Hurricanes, for as good as they are, they're still an interesting team of proving that they are the real deal. If this is even going to make sense at all. They're a great team. Do not do not get me wrong. They're a phenomenal team. And I am scared to play them at times. But I just don't see them fulfilling their expectations. The Rangers might be able to do it. They might also take a step back, though. But they added some good pieces. And if uh, Shesterkin is still as good as he may is supposed to be, then that's going to be difficult. But I think we're able to fly above one of the two because everyone behind us, well, Capitals, Islanders, Blue Jackets, who I think are greatly improved, but still can't do it. Devils and Flyers, we're better than all those teams. The Caps are going to struggle out the gate and might not be able to rebuild it. Because they're down really? Backstrom. Oh, they're down Backstrom and Tom Wilson. They were That's down they were down TJ Yoshi, Anthony Mantha, and Nick Backstrom last year, and they got off to a hot start. They were in first place for the most of the beginning of the season, though. But that's that's a, that's a different conversation. You don't need TJ Yoshi, though. 
I'll stand by that. I will stand I by that to this day. To differ. I, I think you're just hating on, on somebody because you don't like him as a person. Oh, I love TJ as a person. Well, as a, as a, like as a, as a player, player on the ice, that's yeah. what I mean. Yeah, and I've never liked him as a player all these years. They t- Take me back to the St. Louis Blues days. I will stand on that mountain. That being said, we're still a better team than these teams. Mm-hmm. The Penguins are still better than these teams. And if they're able to find sneaky wins from other teams around the league, they're going to bump over. That's just the way it is. It's not going to be by beating the, the Metro specifically, but it is by winning the easy games in Seattle, winning the easy games in San Jose. Vegas is not the same team anymore. Picking up a couple of wins here and there outside of the Metro should be able to bump your numbers. I think you're you're massively disrespecting both the Vegas Golden Knights and the Seattle Kraken, but we can get into it. We can Quick, name Vegas' goalies. Logan Thompson Damn is going to be really good this year. Is like, he? All right. He, I don't think anybody understands that Logan Thompson is not a scrub. Like, just because he's not Robin Leonard or Mark andre Fleury does not mean that he's a scrub. And that team has always been good. They've always had good defense. They were so beyond injured last year, like extremely beyond injured last year, that it was ridiculous. And then Robin Leonard being out, here's the thing. Logan Thompson's going to have all season. I'm going to back him until he proves me otherwise. So I'm on Logan Thompson. I'm on the the Vegas Golden Knights. I think the Kraken are going to be much better this year. I don't think there's easy wins to be had in anywhere in the NHL, except for on opening night against the Arizona Coyotes, and they better pull it out. We will preview that game on our Thursday episode this week on game day. But for right now, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, our weekly pens pull. Welcome back to the Tip of the Iceberg podcast, brought to you as always by InsideThePenguins.com. We're talking about the Pittsburgh Penguins on opening week of the 2022-23 NHL regular season. Our weekly pens poll got a whole lot of answers. Not often do we get other winning the poll, but we asked who will score the Penguins' first goal of the season. We hope it's on Thursday. Might come on sun- Saturday, excuse me. But other won the poll at 31%. We will go to all of your predictions here in a second. The rest of the scoring, Jake Gensel finished with 30%. So a lot of love for Jake Gensel because he gets 30% opposed to the field, which was 31%. Sidney Crosby got 22% of the vote and Evgeny Malkin finished with 17% of the vote. Before we head into the comments section and say who our listeners, who our followers believe will score first, Horwat, who do you think scores first on Thursday? Hopefully. Man, it, it really is. The the, the, the the discussion of first goal is always just pick a name out of a hat because it can be anyone. I'm trying to filter through some of the last few, um, and they are some names. Last season was Danton Heinen. Season before that, oh, get ready for this. It was Mark Jankowski. hey Season before that was Evgeny Malkin, so that's a bonus. And the season before that, I'm about to find out, was... <sighs> Jamie Oleksiak. I, I knew Jamie Oleksiak scored one of them. I just, I didn't remember how long ago it was. And that Evgeny Malkin one uh, was a power play goal in a three to one loss to the Buffalo Sabres. Yep. Yes, sir. Yeah. So it's, it, it truly is just always a crapshoot over who um, picks up the first goal of a season. I think though, for however, just because it is the first of 50, Jake Gensel. You're going to Jake Gensel? Okay. He's going to start the season off right away. Mm-hmm. I have other in this particular category because, and there's some people that will agree with me. I think Ricky Rax, Ricard Raquel, scores the opening goal of the 2022-23 regular season. If for no other reason, then I really liked what I saw from Gensel, Crosby, and Raquel. And I wanted to go with the other there because, you know, Gensel's going to get his 50 goals. We both have stated that we believe he'll get to that plateau on this podcast. Uh, Sidney Crosby to 100 points, yes. But uh, Ricardo Raquel, and honestly, this is going to be outdated by the time, like this is going to be old takes exposed and probably not even going to be close, but Ricardo Raquel scores the first goal of the Pittsburgh Penguins season. Two minutes (laughs) and 53 seconds into the first period on a one-time backdoor wide-open goal assisted by Crosby, set up by Gensel. The fans aren't even in their seats yet. 
Yeah, that's what, well, it's the I would hope that's fans true. are in their seats. It is the is the home opener. So we're hoping that's what happens. But let's get to the the, the comments from a lot of the followers. Of course, Hockey Troll jumping in there saying they won't score a single goal this season. We'll scroll right past that uh that troll because obviously he's speaking out of malice. But Penn's Country on Twitter says Zucker. Ali says Heinen. Two Wesley Reed says Rust Raquel or Latang. He's trying to play the odds game there. Uh, like getting a lot. Richard Blosser, friend of the show, says the book of Malkin. Of course, with Evgeny Malkin. Penn's hen goes with Brian Rust. Two uncle, two. I don't know what that is. Thick Sydney. I love that. Thick Sydney on Twitter says, I want to say Jari because it's funny, but it'll probably it's be Archibald. Hilarious. Josh Archibald, you know. Uh, Josh Archibald got another one. It'll be Ultra Archibald, then he'll promptly never score again. The Mark Jankowski effect. People are down on Archibald. I put his get, invest in Archibald stock. I bet. Really? Uh, well, we can get into it other for other reasons in other days, but I think so. We will talk about it on Thursday, Horwood. I'll, mm-hmm. I'll make a note. Ask about Archibald on Thursday episode. There we go. We'll talk about it then. Uh, Gregler says, "I'm going with Ricard. He has some of the best goaling against him in his time with the Penguins. Time for his luck to turn. I like it." JT says, "Kapanen and Pitt Pen's God." says Brock McGinn. Any thoughts on the Brock McGinn love from our comment section? He always scores the weird ones. It's always the, hey, he has a game winner here, a game winner there, a power play, a shorty hey, a shorty here. Uh, why not first of the season? Why not? And possibly last. Some Whoever scores first, I hope, scores the last regular season goal as well. I don't know why. I just think that'd be fun. Bookend well, this season. There you go. I like it. Well, we will be back on Thursday with a brand new episode on penguins opening night at ppg paints arena against the arizona coyotes we will preview that game against the yotes we will ask horwat why you should buy stock in josh archibald and we'll talk about plenty more on the tip of the iceberg podcast but that's going to do it for this one have a great week pens fans 